Welcome to Econ 102, where economist Noah Smith and I make sense of what's happening in the news, technology, business, and beyond through the lens of economics. Let's jump right in. This piece that you wrote about is Asimoglu, awesome, because one of the places it seems like you disagree with him a lot is his thoughts on AI. But also you wrote about this idea in your piece that people often equate the strengthening of or improvement of our models with sort of the improvement of accuracy and truthfulness, truthiness. And, and you write about how this idea of, Hey, maybe power and truthiness are actually not correlated. And to the extent they're not correlated, that will present opportunities for humans to, um, you know, be in the value chain or add, add value along the way. Maybe we could start with why Asimoglu is wrong on AI and then we could get into your nuanced view. Well, so, okay. So, I don't know that Asimoglu is necessarily wrong about AI, and he's done a lot of valuable work. Remember, I think Asimoglu is primarily talented as a theorist and kind of honestly mid as an empiricist, and that his virtuosity as a theorist causes people to overbelieve in, you know, have to have too much confidence in his empirical results. So, for example, a paper he did with Pasquale Restrepo found that companies that do more automation hire fewer people, and then or that do that have more industrial robots hire fewer people. And then industries where there's more industrial robot adoption, hire fewer people. So they're like, okay, robots, industrial robots destroy jobs. But then a whole bunch of other people did this with better data, you know, and then, and, and I don't know, whatever, more companies, longer time horizons, better definitions of things, basically better data. A whole bunch of other people did this thing and they found the exact opposite. They found that companies that hire, that, that buy more industrial robots actually hire more humans overall. And that, that has become a pretty robust finding. And it directly contradicts their empirical result, even though their empirical result got a lot more play and a lot more, was a lot more influential than the subsequent many, many papers that rebutted it. And at the same time, they were like, okay, well, it's because those companies just become more dominant. You know, the, the, that's why they hire more humans. But then at the whole industry level, you'd see this, this shift where the industries that automate more, you know, destroy jobs. And then, and then people looked at the industry level and then that, you know, the industries that automate more also gain jobs. And people are like, but the jobs are getting destroyed somewhere. The job destruction must be somewhere. And so eventually you end up doing this at the level of countries to try to look for the job destruction at the most general highest level. And at that point, you get to the point where regressions can't really find anything because like the data is too sparse. There's just not enough data points and it's contaminated by other stuff. And like, and at that point you're like, okay, we declare victory because we took it to a level where we weren't able to actually get good empirical work. Therefore our theory wins. Well, that's not very scientific. And I think that the, the job destroying effects of industrial robots and automation in general are just incredibly hard to find in the data. And ultimately everyone's got a job now. So like however much automation there's been, it didn't stop people from having jobs. You know, middle-class wages are the highest they've ever been. Obviously there's a counterfactual, maybe things would be even better, maybe middle-class wages would be, be even better without any automation, but it's, it's, it's really, really hard to find the job killing effects of automation in the data. And then, you know, and Asimoglu has often played fast and loose with this theory too. For example, he wrote a paper called The Simple Macroeconomics of AI, where he basically, he broke, he used theory to break AI's potential macroeconomic effects, effects on jobs into like multiple things it could do. AI could make you more productive at the things you already do. It could just replace you flat out. It could, it could create new things for you to do, or it could make your tools just more productive, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But the point is then the, the whole thing where it could create new things for you to do, he just assumes that away. He says, I assume this is zero. And, and then, of course, all the results say that AI destroys jobs because you've assumed away the main mechanism by which AI creates jobs. Congratulations. We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. You like to optimize things. You've chosen the perfect credit card to maximize your travel points, and you always find the fastest route when you drive. Shouldn't you handle your charitable giving the same way? GiveWell spends 50,000 hours every year doing deep dives into different charitable programs to try to find the ways to do the most good for your dollar. GiveWell has now spent over 17 years researching charitable organizations and only directs funding to a few of the highest impact opportunities they've found. Over 100,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $2 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 200,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. It's easy to see why the Boston Globe called GiveWell the gold standard for giving. GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high-impact giving. You can find all of their research and recommendations on their site for free. 
You can make tax-deductible donations to their recommended funds or charities, and GiveWell doesn't take a cut. Go to GiveWell.org to find out more or make a donation. Select Podcast and enter Econ102 at checkout to make sure they know you heard about them from us. Again, that's GiveWell.org to donate or find out more. You know, he's a talented theorist for breaking down the potential effects of AI into this very clear taxonomy that you could then potentially measure maybe if you had good enough data. But then as a polemicist, as a blogger, as a, as a public intellectual, he just turns off a piece of his model in order to, to assume his desired conclusion that AI kills jobs. That's malpractice. And, you know, as, as, a, as a blogger, that's blogger malpractice, all right? probably, I mean, research wise, it's not malpractice, it's just a, you can make whatever assumptions you want. And people can decide how smart they think that is or not. But it doesn't, doesn't pass the sniff test. No, you shouldn't do that. And so and then he wrote this book with with Johnson, Power and Progress, that it just had a whole lot of historical howlers. Did we ever did we ever do that review on Did we ever do? A, I think we alluded to it, but we haven't done a dedicated segment on it. So we should. Right. Okay. So a lot of it is just economic history. And basically, the economic history is meant to tell the story that that tech bros want to destroy jobs. So you can't let the tech bros invent what they want. You have to force them to invent stuff that creates jobs. That's the basic message of power and progress. But we won't know what creates jobs, right? Isn't it uh, kind of difficult to anticipate? (laughs) Yes. That is one of about a thousand reasons why this book is just one of the worst nonfiction books I've ever read. So for example, they talk, they say they're making a point. Technology can be used for good purposes or bad purposes. And then they list new inventions that brought nothing like shared prosperity. Here's an example. I'm quoting from Asimoglu and Johnson's book. At the end of the 19th century, German chemist Fritz Haber developed artificial fertilizers that boosted agricultural yields. Subsequently, Haber and other scientists used the same ideas to design chemical weapons that killed and maimed hundreds of thousands on World War I battlefields. In case you don't know about the, the Haber-Bosch process, this is what this is what allows artificial fertilization, fertilizer, which is responsible for feeding the entire world. If artificial fertilizer were not usable, if this one chemi- chemical discovery were not usable, bil- literally billions of humans would starve to death. We could not, we could only support a population of like, I don't know, 5 billion or 4 billion or something like that. We could not support the number of people, like billions would starve without this, this thing. And it's, it's, it's just the most important you know, agricultural innovation in all of history, even more important than the Green Revolution. And so they said, oh, but because also similar chemical reactions were responsible for chemical weapons in World War I, we don't know if this is good or bad. That's, in, that's, not, that's intentionally dumb when you say something like that. that. That was the worst howler in a book full of howlers. Actually, it's just, it's just chock full of howlers. Like, but I just can't imagine how they allow themselves to put that on paper. It doesn't even pass the sniff test. Yeah. It doesn't pass the sniff test at all. And then, yeah, so anyway, I I list like a whole bunch of these and I'm just like, the history in this book is just terrible. It also doesn't cite sources. It just has a, it just has a a bibliographic essay where they just mention all the places that things they read to produce this book, but it doesn't connect individual assertions to individual sources. So you don't know where it came from, which is, that is, that's terrible. Like how do, how can I disprove a lot of stuff? So I had to go reading all those papers. This took me like, this, this review took me like a week to write because I was reading all these papers and hunting down these things because they didn't cite their sources. Anyway, I really don't like this book. Also, as power, when they define power, it's not some Marxist thing. It's actually, they just say power is the power to persuade. If you persuade people to allow you to invent job-killing technologies, you have power. Why do people, why are people able to persuade people to allow them to invent these technologies? I don't know. Maybe it's just luck. So power is like rhetorical luck to these guys. That makes no sense to me. Like nobody thinks that's a good definition of power. And they, they, they basically think that accidental success in a nonviolent marketplace of ideas is in the same conceptual category as slavery and feudalism, which they compare it to. They say those were cases where power determined economic outcomes. Also, tech bros writing, you know, VCs writing op-eds that, 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 you know, reduce appetite for AI regulation. That's also power if people are persuaded by those op-eds. Well, that's dumb. That, like, how can you write that in a book? and have people think you're like the top intellectual on the subject. I don't understand it. It was just terrible. And there, there's a whole lot of other problems. So my review is about 7,000 words. You can go read it. And then there's just like lots of things. There's, there's empirical mistakes too. There's like the facts they claim that are just like the opposite of right. And then, and there's lots of stuff they just don't grapple with and they just avoid. 
anyway, it's bad. It's a really bad book. I didn't like it. It's, it's, it's fractally bad in that you'll see like a whole big claim will be bad, but you'll zoom in and see tons of tiny little incidental off the cuff bad claims that they didn't necessarily need to make in order to support the big bad claim, but that they make anyway just because they can and which are bad. Yeah. I'm very frustrated. In case you can't tell, I'm really frustrated. I spent a lot of time reading this book. I, it's, it's possible to frustrate me to the point where, you know, I, I lose my cool and this book just really, oh man. 7,000 word takes out. Amazing. I want that. I want those weeks of my life back, man, bro. And he wins a Nobel. Crazy. Econ 102 is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen, In the Arena, The Cognitive Revolution, and more. If you like what you hear, subscribe and leave us the review in the App Store. You can keep up with both of our substacks for written analysis of the topics we cover in the show at noahopinion.substack.com and erictornberg.substack.com. Thanks for listening.